Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Varsity Tutors Star Course series, where if you've been fortunate enough to catch some of our earlier lessons with Butterfly Pavilion, you already know that there is so much more to their work than butterflies. From mother flying creatures like moths and bees to creepy crawlers like the cockroach, we've been introduced to all sorts of incredible invertebrates, but today we're going to take a look at a creature that makes up well, a little more of the animal kingdom than you might think, the beetle. We're going to get to learn all about these cool critters, and we may even have a few live guest appearances. So before I turn it over to your expert instructor for today, Kalei Thomas, I want to make sure we are ready to collaborate and learn as much as possible in today's live lesson. So Kalei is going to have some questions for you, and you'll probably have questions for her as well. Feel free to use the chat function in your online lear live learning platform to ask and answer any questions throughout the lesson. And if we don't get to those questions right away, not to worry, we'll have about 10 minutes at the close of the lesson specifically set aside for Q&A. You'll also wanna be sure that you have your cameras close by because toward the end of the lesson, we're gonna have the opportunity to lean into the screen for a selfie with one of our guest appearances. And I won't spoil too much just yet, uh, but if you post those selfies on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors and Butterfly Pavilion, you'll be entered to win a children's activity book, Tarantula Tracks, as well as a one month subscription to the after school club of your choice. I'll talk a little bit more about that prize and how to enter in just a little bit. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and hand things off to your instructor for today, Kalei Thomas. Awesome. Thank you so much, Haley. I'm so excited to be back here with some more animal visitors today. Uh, we're definitely going to have a good time talking about some maybe creepy crawlies to some, but maybe by the end you'll change your mind on that. Um, today we are going to be focusing a little bit more on beetles. And these are some animals that um, are a little unknown to me as well. So we've, we're going to do a lot of learning together, um, but we might have a good chance to see some different things today. And for those of you who haven't had a chance to visit a butterfly pavilion program before, you may be wondering, why are we talking about beetles when clearly you guys talk about butterflies a lot, right? And there's a really great explanation for that. So we're going to think about it in just a moment. Um, I want us to start off a little bit by thinking about um, our own selves, right? So if you actually um, give me a big thumbs up, maybe take your thumb and then run it down the middle of your neck or down the middle of your back, you should feel something kind of bumpy or hard back there, right? And that is your spine, your backbone. And so because you have a spine or a backbone, we would call you a vertebrate. But all of my animals at my very special zoo don't have that. They don't have any spines or backbones or any bones at all. So we call them invertebrates. And while Butterfly Pavilion does have butterflies, we really like to think of ourselves as an invertebrate zoo, meaning we show off things like butterflies, but also tarantulas, millipedes, sea stars, and octopus, all kinds of really fascinating animals like that. And part of why we like to show off specifically invertebrates is because they actually make up most of the world's animals. So if you look at this circle to the side here, and we said that um, this circle represented every single type of animal in the world, everything in blue is representing an invertebrate. So that 97% of our circle here represents those butterflies and cockroaches and tarantulas, all those kinds of cool things. And that tiny little orange part of my circle is representing the animals with bones. So animals like humans, dogs, cats, fish, reptiles, birds, all of those animals with bones are really only a tiny, tiny percent of the world's animals and the rest are invertebrates. But that's not the only reason we like to talk about invertebrates here at Butterfly Pavilion. We happen to think that invertebrates are really, really important. So I would love it if you would share with me in the chat um, some reasons you might think that invertebrates are important. And maybe you can use one of these pictures as inspiration um, or think about um, maybe some kind of bug or insect you've seen today or recently and tell me why you think that one is kind of important. Go ahead and take a moment to let us know. I love seeing all of your answers come in. <laughs> and one of my favorites I'll start with, I think a lot of you are thinking this, um, but 
Invertebrates can sometimes be really amazing pollinators. So animals like bees and butterflies are great visitors in our gardens and help our flowers um, produce seeds and help them grow even more. Um, and sometimes can even help us with uh, the foods that we really enjoy, for sure. Some of you are talking about the spider maybe, how um, they really help catch bugs that maybe we don't want around. So even if we're kind of scared of the spiders in our homes, um, we want to leave them there. So they eat some of the flies and things that we don't want hanging around. And I definitely would love to hear, keep bringing those comments in. We're maybe going to see a little bit about why um, the invertebrate we're talking about today is important. On top of that, we're really gonna be focusing on a specific type of invertebrate. You may have already seen a few hints, we might already know, but we're gonna learn how to identify them from others. Um, I'm going to share with you a few of the really common questions about this invertebrate, um, but definitely put in some of your own questions as we get to know them a little bit more. And as I said, we're going to find out why it's so important that um, the bug or invertebrate we're meeting today is really important. So with that being said, you know, we've thought about narrowing, narrowing down all of the world's animals into just invertebrates. And even if we were gonna talk about just invertebrates overall today, we'd be sitting here for hours learning about every single type. You can see all of the different kinds pictured here, but we are gonna focus it down a little bit to insects and we'll narrow it down even more from there. But we're thinking about this group that includes bees, beetles, butterflies, dragonflies, ants, all kinds of amazing little creepy crawlies today. And to think about our insects a little further, we're going to use this example of a cactus longhorn beetle um, to think about how we can identify insects from other animals. So what is something that we already know about how we can tell insects apart from other animals? Let me know in the chat. Is there something we can see on their bodies? Anything like that that can tell us, yes, this animal is an insect. I think one of the most common things I'm seeing is they have six legs. Yes, all insects are going to have six legs. Um, so those are going to make them a little different from things like spiders, right? Spiders can't be insects because they have more than six legs. Something like a worm can't be an insect because it has zero legs. So I, absolutely. I'm also seeing some of us say like wings, right? A lot of insects do have wings, but not every single insect does. So we might think about that a little bit later, but there are some like some types of ants don't have wings. So that could be important to think about too. Um, but I'm also seeing um, some of us are saying body parts or giving specific names of body parts, right? So absolutely, all insects have to have three body parts, a head, a middle body part called a thorax, and this is where their legs and wings are gonna be attached if they have them, and an abdomen, which is where all of their guts and their organs are located. So those are their three body parts. And the last thing every single insect is going to have are two antennas. So two antenna right attached to their head, these help them sense the world around them and get a better idea of smells or things like that that may be surrounding them. So that's how we can tell insects apart. And we're gonna narrow it down even further today. If you've joined us before, we talked about insects as cockroaches, right? But there are lots of different cockroaches or insects in the world. So we're going to be thinking about beetles today. And one thing I really want us to think about with beetles is that there are a lot of different kinds of beetles in the world. So um, I want everyone to maybe close their eyes for a moment Imagine you're sitting in a big football stadium or baseball stadium, you're watching a game, right? And you decide you want to invite some beetles to join you, every single beetle in the world. So we'll invite one type of every single beetle and we'll give each one a seat. So you filled this entire stadium with beetles and we still have more. You would actually need about seven stadiums full of beetles to get every single beetle in the world to join you. Um, there are 350,000 types of beetles, which means if we look back at our circle, they're actually a really huge chunk of all the animals in the world. Um, and they're just beetles, right? There's We're not even thinking about the other invertebrates like uh, butterflies or moths or anything like that. About one fourth of the animals in the world are beetles. So when we ask questions today, um, like we'll start with a few in a moment, we have to sometimes remember that the answers are gonna be different because there are thousands and thousands of beetles. There might be some beetle 
um, that we answer the question one way and some beetles that we would have to answer it a different way. So um, if we start with something like, where can you find beetles? Well, that's where we're gonna think about that. Um, you can find beetles all over the world. I obviously didn't include all 350,000 types of beetles on my map here, but I did include some of the ones we're gonna talk about today. And you can see even with just a few of them that we're gonna think about, they are all over the place. So we might find some in North America, some in South and Central America. There are some in Africa. Asia, Europe, Australia, practically all over the place. The only place there might not be some beetles to find are Antarctica. But you know what? Scientists are always discovering more beetles. We're finding them um, every year. There's more and more. So maybe we will someday discover some down there. So if we think about them living everywhere, next I want us to think about what beetles might eat. Um, and maybe you can put some thoughts in the chat for me. What do you think beetles might eat? Uh, if we've thought about other insects, maybe we know butterflies eat nectar or sugar water. Um, but what do beetles eat? And if you've kind of caught on, you might realize that it depends on the beetle. I can see some of you were starting to say things like plants or other bugs. And that's true, but it depends on what beetle we're talking about. So some beetles are going to be herbivores, which means that they eat parts of plants. And even among the beetles that eat plants, it's going to be kind of different. Some beetles will only eat fruits or vegetables, or some might only eat leaves or flowers. So that's going to be different even among the ones that eat plants. There are going to be some that will be carnivores, meaning they eat meat. And they might not eat meat like we do, right? They might not eat chickens or cows, um, but they are going to eat um, bugs. So they might eat other insects, depending on their size, maybe spiders or things like that, um, but they will eat other animals. And then there are going to be a lot of beetles that are going to be detritivores or um, omnivores, but this means that they might eat all kinds of different things, plants, animals, um, anything that they can get their hands on. And in the case of detritivores, it means that they'll also eat the dead things. So they don't mind the rotting, decaying fruits and things like that. Like if you've ever, ever had bananas go bad in your home or any kind of fruit go bad in your home, beetles love to eat that. So um, basically anything you can think of that some animals eat, there's probably a beetle who wants to eat that as well. One of the really fun things, we have a Hercules beetle here who is kind of shoving their face into their fruit. They're definitely more of those fruit eaters, um, but they are really, really good at eating partially because they don't have to breathe through their mouths. So beetles and all insects actually breathe through holes on their body. So sometimes when we see our beetles eating, they really just kind of push their face all the way into the food and they just sit there for minutes, maybe even hours, just eating the food like that because they don't need to breathe. They can just breathe through the holes on their body and keep eating through their mouth. Um, beetles have really special mouth parts called mandibles that can be used to kind of crush their food or cut their food depending on what they're eating. Um, and it's kind of an important um, distinction to think about, right? For beetles and some other insects, we think of them as mandibles, um, but things like a spider, right? We wouldn't call a spider's things mandibles, we call them fangs. So that's um, kind of a difference you can think of there in some of these animals. But for beetles, they're going to be mandibles. We'll think a lot about that a little bit later. And then the way they breathe is not through their mouth, but through holes on their bodies. And we'll also think a little bit today about how beetles are growing. So some of you may have already had questions about this. Um, do beetles look the same when they start out? Um, do they um, change at all? And they do kind of change. So we'll see a little bit of them here. These are some jade-headed buffalo beetles. And every animal you see in this picture is that type of beetle because um, the little tiny worm-like things you might see are called larva, and they are the baby beetles um, for this type of beetle. So maybe when you see that one who's kind of squirming, you can even see kind of some legs underneath him. So even though they look like they might have zero legs, they do have six, so they are an insect, and they are a baby version of this insect. And it makes me wonder if any of you can think of another animal that looks maybe kind of different as a baby and goes through different stages as it grows up. So maybe four different stages, if that helps. 
if you're thinking of a butterfly, you're absolutely right. So butterflies and beetles and all kinds of insects, really, ants, bees, moths, they go through a complete metamorphosis. So this means that they are going to go through a few different stages. They'll start off as an egg, like a lot of insects will. And then out of that egg will hatch a larva. And the larva is really what's going to be doing a lot of eating. Um, sometimes as adults, they'll still eat, but the larva is really focused on growing as much as they can. And for the beetles, this is what a baby beetle might look like. You can see that in a little bit too. But once they've grown as much as they can, they're going to go into a stage that really doesn't move all that much. Um, you can think of this like a butterfly chrysalis, but we can always call it a pupa as well. And in this stage, they will completely change their body until they come out as an adult beetle. And then the adults can lay eggs and start the process all over again. So I actually do have um, some beetles here today that are really good examples of these different stages. We're gonna take a look at um, how they might um, look a little different, right? Because as we start to get a close look at some of these guys, we might see them and not really think that they look like beetles, right? So over here we have our beetle larva. I'm gonna see if this one wants to hang out with me today um, and get a closer look. Um, but he does look a little bit like a worm, right? And maybe if we can see underneath, you can start to see his legs just a little bit. Um, so we can tell that um, he's not a worm. He is an insect. Oh, yeah, he turned over briefly there. Maybe we saw it a little better. Um, but what I really want us to think about is, you know, it's not just a larva or just like a caterpillar. It seems kind of different from a butterfly, right? This is a beetle. It's just a beetle that looks a little different right now, right? It's just a baby beetle who's going to grow up once he eats as much as he can. Um, these guys really like their oats actually, so they'll climb around in them and eat those as well as some fruit they've got to the side there. But once he does grow and eat as much as possible, he's going to turn into a pupa. So I'm gonna see if this guy, sometimes they'll move kind of slightly if something touches them. Yeah, he's not really into it. He's really um, maybe kind of relaxed and just focused on changing completely into an adult beetle. And these are actually a type of darkling beetle. So when they completely grow up, they're going to look like this. So all three stages here, we don't have the eggs. They're kind of small and they don't do much. Um, but the other stages of this beetle's life, um, you can kind of see right here. And these guys, sometimes you can see all of those really important body parts and legs and things, um, but they also do a really good job of blending into um, the soil that they live in. So it might be a little hard to see some of that. These um, dark green beetles can also sometimes be, um, some of them can be kind of stink bugs. So that's why you may not see me hold some of these guys as well, because um, they can be kind of smelly when they feel threatened. So we'll leave them alone. <laughs> but all of these that we see here, they are all beetles. So even when a beetle might look a little different than we expect, um, it's important to think about some of those differences and um, how we can tell them, um, even when there are so many different kinds of beetles, they'll look different. Um, all the species will have all these different kinds of stages. So there will be some really big beetles that have really big baby stages as well. So we'll go ahead and think back. Once Now that we've kind of established how they might look different, um, we can think about some other questions. Like I think some of you have been asking if beetles can fly. Um, so you can kind of see in the, or when we were looking at the baby beetles, how they weren't really, you know, they didn't have wings. They really crawl on the ground. Um, so when they're in the larva stage or the baby stage, they really can't fly. But as adults, every single beetle has two sets of wings. So there's a really hard pair on top that you might see in this beetle as it kind of opens it a little bit. Um, but we call that pair elytra and they're not used for flying. They're really just there to protect the beetle. So especially when you see them take off, they'll kind of open up the elytra and let the good wings underneath do all the work. And then, yeah, there is a second pair of wings underneath that's a little bit softer and what they actually use for flying. So even though like all beetles have these, um, a lot of them actually don't fly. So even though they can fly, they may choose to very rarely fly um, or they might not fly at all. Some of them have the elytra um, closed all the time and can't fly. So 
um, the darkling beetles that we saw here, I have never ever seen them fly because um, they just are maybe a little too big or a little too awkward to use those elytra or open them. But um, like the African fruit chafers here, um, they do sometimes fly, but it's very, very rare. And most of the time you'll see them kind of crawling around on the ground or climbing on some of their branches like you can see them here. So that's one thing you might notice. And one way you can tell beetles apart from other insects is by looking for those elytra or those wings um, that they might have on their back. And for a lot of beetles, they're very colorful um, or you can notice them really well. Another interesting thing to tell about adult beetles especially um, is that you can sometimes tell the boys and girls apart. So when we saw those darkling beetles, um, we can't really tell them apart. But for something like this Hercules beetle, um, you can tell them apart. The male is the one we were just looking at. And then the female is gonna walk across here and you can maybe see the difference. Um, you can maybe let me know in the chat if you noticed, but a lot of times um, we call this sexual dimorphism. So that fancy phrase basically just means that the boys and the girls look different. And in beetles, some of you may have guessed it, a lot of times the males have really big horns or just really elaborate things on their faces or heads that um, make them look um, kind of bigger um, when the females don't have that as much. So for the Hercules beetle and the um, friends we're about to meet, um, you might be able to see that big difference there. And we're gonna go ahead and take a look at a really special um, beetle that I have for you today. Um, it looks like they kind of all went into hiding, so we'll see if we can find them in their little home here. Go ahead and back up. And these ones you're gonna see definitely show um, those different um, kind of structures on their heads. So this one right here, and it looks like our female unfortunately decided she was ready to hide today, so we'll just let her hang out there. Um, but luckily the male with those really big horns is showing them off right there. And it looks like that female might kind of come out a little bit, so maybe we'll see her move around. Um, but these are giraffe stag beetles. Um, so they are a type of stag beetle. They're called stag beetles because um, a lot of these types of beetles have these really big horns kind of on their head. You see them right there as he's kind of looking around. Um, they almost look like antlers, like on a deer or something. Um, and especially for um, these beetles, there's a really big difference in the females and males. So the males are the ones just like this guy right here who have the really long horns. These are actually on this beetle, um, they're mandibles. So that mouth part we talked about um, is actually that part there. And if uh, the female does poke her head out, you might be able to see um, how her head is a little bit smaller and her mandibles are gonna be closer and um, uh, a little closer to her body and the rest of her mouth. So if she pokes her head out, we'll see. I'll leave them up here for a little bit. Maybe when I come back to it, um, she'll have decided to crawl out a little bit. Um, but that is one way you can tell um, some beetles apart as females and males. If we remember, um, there's thousands of different kinds of beetles in the world. Not all of them are gonna be so easy to tell the boys and girls apart. So we'll go ahead and think back to maybe some of our other questions. Um, some of you may have been wondering how um, beetles can protect themselves. Um, so if we think about beetle adaptations, we'll remember that an adaptation is any way an animal um, can try to survive, right? So beetles have a lot of different ways of doing so. Uh, one of my favorite um, insects in the whole world is actually the one pictured here. It's called a longhorn milkweed beetle. And these guys are actually poisonous. So just like monarch butterflies, they eat a plant called milkweed, which is a poisonous plant. Um, but instead of being hurt by the poison, they actually just keep it in their body. So it doesn't actually affect them, but if something else were to eat them, it would be um, kind of a problem. So they definitely um, have these beautiful colors. Um, the milkweed beetles are this red and black to try to warn off predators from eating them and can basically say, hey, don't eat me, I don't taste very good. 
Some beetles are definitely going to use camouflage, blending in to not draw attention to themselves, right? We saw this a little bit with the darkling beetles earlier. They're gonna be those darker colors, especially if they live in really rich soil like um, the giraffe stags do or the darkling beetles do. It helps them blend in and not draw as much attention to themselves. And then there are gonna be some beetles um, that do something called mimicry. Um, so this might be a little similar to camouflage, but sometimes they, instead of looking like tree bark or a leaf, look like another animal that might scare off predators. So for example, there are some beetles that look like wasps. Uh, they have like black and yellow bands on them. So they're trying to look like something you might wanna stay away from. There are some um, beetles who have really unique behaviors that help protect them. So instead of looking a certain way, um, they will actually act a certain way in order to protect themselves. Um, so the little beetle you're looking at here is called a death, death feigning beetle. And they will actually pretend to die when something scary is around them. So they'll play dead, basically, in the hopes that whatever is poking them or messing with them will leave them alone. So I don't, he's not going to pretend to play dead here because I didn't want to scare this beetle, but he is going to climb around looking off the cute. So um, if they were a little threatened, they would just roll over on their backs, kind of curl up their legs and pretend to look dead, um, hoping that they'll be left alone. <laughs> So before I open it up to some of uh, your questions that you've been sending in, I do have one last thing I want to share about beetles, um, and that is about whether or not they are pests or if they're beneficial or important to us, right? And like with everything else we might talk about today, it depends on the beetle. So there are some that are going to be pests. Um, particularly if we're looking at this beautiful beetle, we'll see it up close again, um, but these are Japanese beetles. And in their native habitat of Japan, they are not pests. Um, they have a lot of natural predators and things that will um, eat them, so they're kind of kept in check. Um, but a long time ago, probably about 100 years or so, um, they were moved um, accidentally out of the country and into some other countries. And um, they were moved into places where they didn't really have a lot of predators and so they could just multiply and multiply and become a big problem. So um, that is why we call them an invasive species, especially if we're thinking about the United States or other countries they've moved to outside of Japan, um, then we would consider them invasive, meaning that they are somewhat of a problem. And as you might see, kind of as we scan this area, all those leaves that kind of look like just their skeletons of leaves, right? They have all these little pieces missing from them is part of why they're a really big problem. Gardeners really don't like to see these beetles because it means that they are eating all of their plants. So even though they are a really beautiful beetle and you know they do have their place in Japan, um, they are a pest outside of Japan. Um, the other side of that though, is if we think about some other types of insects that are pests, um, these little yellow dots all along this plant are called aphids. And they are a big pest in gardens too, just like the Japanese beetles. Um, but they are actually hunted by a very vicious predator who loves to eat them and helps out our gardens. That predator is a ladybug. And even though we don't think of ladybugs as beetles, they are, their full name is the ladybird beetle. So they are a type of beetle. And while they are not a pest, they are actually very useful to our gardens because they'll eat all of these other pests and um, help kind of clean up the aphids and keep our gardens safe from being chewed up by all of them. So um, just like we've been thinking about with everything, there are some beetles that are pests and there are some that are gonna help us with their pests. So there are both sides to this, especially with all of the different types of beetles in the world. So with that, I would love to know um, some of the other questions we might have been thinking about today. Um, hopefully we answered some of them as we went through, but um, I'm sure there's a lot more because I definitely have a lot of questions about beetles when I'm learning about them. So there are <laughs> definitely some really fantastic questions. And before we get to those questions, I do want to make sure we've had some really great opportunities to get to 
to get to see up close some of these magnificent beetles. And I think we'd like maybe one more opportunity so that we can snap a selfie with our beetle friends today. And as everyone's getting their cameras at the ready and as Calais is figuring, figuring out whether the beetles are gonna be cooperative with us today, as a reminder, <laughs> if you post these selfies on Instagram and you tag us here at Varsity Tutors as well as Butterfly Pavilion, you'll be entered to win that activity book as well as an enrollment in an after-school club of your choice. So whether you want to delve further into the world of animals in Wildlife Creature Club, learn to draw them in Young Animators Club, or better understand the world around you with a Curious World or Weather Wonders Club membership, there is an after-school club for you. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Kalei, who can maybe tell us a little more about this very active friend we have on screen. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So definitely, I don't know what he's going to do next. He might try digging down in the dirt. So if you're going to try to grab your selfie with him, um, do it quickly, because um, you never know. But he might decide to kind of hang out and be a good little picture taker for a little bit. Um, but these guys are um, really fascinating. Something I really love about um, animals like this that show this really great difference in the males and females is that often when the males have something really elaborate like this, um, it kind of makes them a little less useful. So because those like big mandibles have become so large, they're actually not as strong as the mandibles on like the females. So he can't really grip things as well as her. And there are some animals that really like take this to an extreme where like they can't even use a certain body part or a mouth part because they're so concerned with trying to impress the ladies with them. So um, it's kind of something interesting to note about them. Um, we can't ever house the males together because the part of the reason they have those big jaws is they like to use them to fight. It's how they show the ladies that they are really awesome and the best beetle to date. So um, they will kind of use those. They'll kind of hook them with each other and try to throw each other off of logs. So um, that's why in this little area here, we only have one male and one female. So we don't have any problems like that, but yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Wow, that is amazing. And you did such a fantastic job of answering all of those questions around why the males and the females have uh, have different looking mandibles uh, right as they were coming in. So thank you so much. Hopefully everybody had an opportunity to snap that selfie and uh, we've got some really wonderful questions if you're ready awesome. for it. Yeah, for sure. All right, wonderful. So we uh, we had quite a few questions around ladybugs in particular throughout the lesson. And uh, nice. first off, asking whether ladybugs would fall under the umbrella of beetles, which we now know is the case, um, but also wondering if there's just one type of ladybug, because I think students have seen that they can, they can look a little different. Absolutely. Um, just like with other beetles, there are thousands of types of ladybugs. Um, so especially when we think about any of the beetles we've seen today, the darkling beetles, the stag beetles, the longhorn beetles, those are all really kind of generic groups of beetles. So there are hundreds, sometimes thousands of different types of those beetles. The stag beetles, for example, there's um, maybe a few hundred types of them, maybe a little less. Um, the darkling beetles, there's, I've heard like eight or 900 types of them and the ladybugs are the same way. So there are, um, I think I looked it up recently, thousands of types of ladybugs, but that might be a good opportunity to do some further research and see if we can find out some other types of ladybugs we might not be familiar with. Wow, that is so amazing. And on a similar question, I know we talked about the fact that there are so, so many types of invertebrates. So <laughs> students were wondering roughly how many types do you have under your care at Butter Butterfly Pavilion? And do you have a favorite? Oh, so how many types? Um, there's probably a few hundred types of invertebrates. I guess there's, um, you know, we have a few hundred types of butterflies alone. So there's probably, it's closer to like four to 500 different types of animals. Um, individuals, probably numbers in the thousands, just because we have really large colonies of some animals like bees or cockroaches or things like that. So they have a lot of numbers in the individual type. And my favorite type is actually sea stars. So they are um, so cool. Um, if you ever have the chance to visit us at Butterfly Pavilion, we actually do let you touch sea stars. So I always think that's super fun to try. Um, and something fun about them, they um, kind of like beetles, there's a lot of different types of sea stars. So we may think of sea stars as being one thing, but there are a few hundred species of them. So you might expect them to feel one way, 
and some of them may feel different. So some may feel soft and squishy, some may feel kind of rough and hard or um, just kind of different. So it's really interesting to see what people expect and how sometimes it's a little different. Absolutely. And I think we've already gotten a little bit in, in today's lesson and in all the lessons we've had the fortune to move through so far of seeing how there's a little more than first meets the eye about all of these creatures, which we've fondly been refer for referring to as creepy crawlers, but we know they're not always so creepy. Uh, <laughs> We had, uh, we had quite a few students who asked some pretty specific questions around superlatives for our beetles. So what's the biggest beetle and the strongest beetle and maybe the most well-traveled beetle? So maybe could you speak to just a couple of your favorite super superlatives, biggest, best, uh, cool characteristics? Yeah, for sure. Um, the giraffe stag beetle is actually the biggest stag beetle. So that's kind of fun to think about. Um, he's not very big, but one of the biggest of the stags. Um, and I think, it's a little hard to tell bigot or like biggest because you have to think about how you're judging biggest. So it might be longest or it might be heaviest. Um, I think that the heaviest most people talk about is the Hercules beetle. So when we saw that one that had the really long horn on top, that might be considered the heaviest. Um, but there is, I, I forget what it's called, but a type of beetle that has this really long horn that kind of bends too. So it ends up being really long. Um, so that's kind of one thing to think about is you have to really narrow down what you want to know when you're thinking about like, oh, the biggest beetle. Um, and then um, I think the uh, jade-headed buffalo beetle we saw um, is just another one that's really cool. Um, they don't really have any big superlatives, um, but they were the ones who had like the green heads and we saw some of their babies, um, but they are just like um, the giraffe be stags and the Hercules beetles where the males have smaller horns, but they'll fight each other um, over the females. And they are actually ones we have on display all the time and they are just so active with it. Like it's hard to see the Hercules beetles and giraffe stags kind of fight each other um, just because they are bigger. So we don't want them to hurt each other. Um, but since the jade headed beetles are so small and do live fairly well together, you can actually see the males like hook horns and toss each other off of sticks because they're so just into it and trying to prove that they're the best male beetle. <laughs> wow, that is, uh, that is pretty intense. We, uh, we had some students as well who were wondering, of course, we know that um, education is a very large part of what you do as an organization, but what other sorts of things is Butterfly Pavilion up to? What, do you, what does your facility entail? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we are an AZA accredited zoo. So that means that we, um, that's the American Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which basically just means that we take really good care of our animals. But it also means that we have to take care of animals in their native habitats around the world. So on top of doing education, um, we actually go out to different countries and do different research project, projects or conservation projects. And sometimes those projects can even help um, bigger animals or non-invertebrates. Um, we actually, one of my favorite projects we do um, is called um, the Bee Fencing Project. And we will go out to, um, we've gone to Nepal and Tanzania, so both Africa and parts of Asia. And we've built um, fences around farms that are made of beehives, which sounds kind of funny, um, but part of why we do it is because when an elephant comes in to try to eat the crops at these farms, they knock into the beehives, which makes the bees swarm the elephant and sting their eyes. Doesn't kill the elephant or anything, but the elephant runs away because it doesn't want to be stung. And so it leaves the farms alone, which means that there are fewer elephants being killed by farmers who just want to protect their crops. Um, and on top of that, the farmers now have their crops and they also have honey that they can sell. So it's really good for the elephants really good for the bees and really good for the people who live there. So that's one of my favorite projects that we do so much around the world and especially in areas where some of these beetles are native to. Wow, that is such a creative solution. Uh, we had, uh, we had some, some questions as well around uh, safely handling these, uh, these invertebrates. I know we, we talk a lot about maybe being fearful of bugs, but you've mentioned a little bit today that the, these bugs can be kind of delicate themselves. So as someone who interacts with and, and cares for these creatures, how do you make sure that you can interact with them in a way that's not just safe to you, but safe to them too? Yeah, absolutely. So part of it is just understanding the animal, right? You have to learn about the animal and know about them. Um, for example, with the giraffe stags, um, 
as I said, like the males, since their mandibles are kind of weak, you probably could hold the male without like them injuring you too bad. The female like could bite you, but would probably, it might hurt a bit, but you wouldn't like be poisoned or anything or um, envenomated or anything like that. Um, so it's just about understanding the animal. Um, part of why I didn't handle or try to touch the stag beetles today is actually because um, I didn't want them to get out. So if they were to escape, um, because they eat plants, they could become an invasive species in Colorado. So I'm more concerned about keeping them here and keeping the Colorado ecosystem safe um, than I am about my safety with them or their safety and being handled. But again, there are some animals like, um, I'll go ahead and talk about the tarantula because our next program with varsity tutors is gonna be all about tarantulas. Um, and we do handle a tarantula. So even though um, she is venomous, her venom's not that bad, so I'm not worried about my safety, but I am worried about her safety. If I dropped her, I could hurt her. So that's why I'm really specially trained in how to know both when she doesn't want to be held, so I don't accidentally make her be held and then she runs and accidentally hurts herself, um, but also just that I know how to be safe for her so that way I can keep her kind of over a flat surface or somewhere where she won't be hurt if she does fall. Wow, and that's a really fantastic point that we're considering not just your safety, not just uh, the animal safety, but also the eco ecosystem safety, especially with some, some animals that you house and care for that we wouldn't want to have uh, make their way into the wild where you're at. Um, now, you mentioned tarantulas and we had some students, I think this is a question we've gotten before, but we had some students who are wondering, um, have you ever been fearful of bugs and what do you do to overcome that? Yeah, I actually personally used to be really scared of a lot of bugs and tarantulas and all kinds of spiders, right? And I think the best thing to do is just to learn about them, which you're all doing a great job of by joining me today, um, but also to kind of expose yourself to them, right? So maybe, you know, learn about which ones you can safely interact with and then get close to them. You don't have to touch them or hold them, um, but just being near them can sometimes make you realize that they're really not that bad, right? Um, like with my giraffe stag beetle here, he's got these really big horns and jaws and he looks like he could just attack you and hurt you but he's not going to. And he's honestly more afraid of me. Like, I think there was a moment when I took the lid off and he was showing off those horns, like, don't hurt me or don't mess with me, right? Because he's worried that I'm gonna eat him. And um, it's definitely a cliche, but they are more scared of us than we are of them. So just keeping that in mind and understanding that they are not out to attack you or they don't intend to hurt you. They just are trying to protect themselves. And even if they do try to bite you or do something to hurt you, it's because they're scared for themselves, so. Yeah, that is absolutely, that is such a great point. And, um, you know, kind of on the flip side, we had some students who maybe aren't fear, fearful of bugs or other animals, but are very excited at the opportunity to get to spend time near animals, learn more about animals, interact with animal safety safely, and who are potentially interested in a career where they have the ability to do so. Do you have any kind of final thoughts or advice for students interested in pursuing a career working with animals, or maybe just different ways they might be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are uh, one of the best ways to get involved in careers is to start off volunteering at different places. So especially as a teenager, there are a lot of zoos and places that have teen volunteer programs where you can go out and just prove that you want to be there and talk to people about the animals or help um, even some of the not fun things like cleaning out animal homes and all of that kind of thing. So the best thing to do is start volunteering as early as you can, get that experience. And then um, definitely as you're thinking about um, maybe further education, um, a lot of like biology courses and um, other kind of science related things are going to be really good. Um, and not just those, but some things like ecology or wildlife preservation are really excellent things to go into too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This is about all the time that we have, but do you have any other closing thoughts, whether they're specific to beetles, which we learned about today, or just to wildlife in general that you'd like to leave the class with? Yeah, absolutely. I would love, um, you know, we're starting to get into some colder months, especially here in the U.S. So as um, we are getting into those colder months, 
Um, it might be good to take these last few opportunities of summer as we're getting into fall to go outside and see what beetles you can find um, in your around your own homes. So even if that means you go to a park or around your school on the playground, um, I bet there are some, um, if not beetles, some invertebrates that you can find and observe and um, find out more about. So um, no matter where you are in the world, um, see what's around you and see if you can find it. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kalei, and thank you so much to the Butterfly Pavilion team. Uh, we were so happy to have you back to talk a little bit about beetles. We're very excited to have you back again soon to talk about tarantulas and maybe get to get a little more of an up close and personal experience there as well. Uh, thank you all of you who joined us for asking such thoughtful and detailed questions. We hope to see you all back in another Varsity Tutors Star Course soon. But in the meantime, we look forward to seeing those selfies. So don't forget to tag us and Butterfly Pavilion to win. Thanks so much, everybody.